Welcome! In this video, we will discuss a quick example for the third case of the WKB or semi-classical approximation, which is of course the case where the energy is comparable to the potential. Now, this, this example will be an example with a potential well where there is only one vertical wall. So basically, we will begin and then we will make it a little bit more general, where we have one infinite wall, so we have the potential as a function of x, and here we have an infinite potential. And here on the right, we have some sort of upsloping potential. Now, of course, it is important to consider that we cannot deal with any sort of downslope for now. I will soon introduce how to um, work with a downslope. Now, our particle will have some energy E. And since the potential is increasing, there will exist some point where the energy will become smaller than the potential, right? We have this region where we have to apply the WKB approximation, as we have seen. Um, and this is the point x2, right? That is the turning point. So for that reason, here we have the classical region, here we have the non-classical region, right? Just a quick reminder. So this is just x in case there's any doubt. Okay, so that is the case in general. We will go to a more specific case soon. So let's recall what our function was because um, this is what we found. And just as we did in the previous cases, right? Cases one and two, we can actually find some pretty interesting results without even specifying a potential. So all that we know about this situation is that it is upslope and that, that means that we can use this formula and there is an infinite potential when x is smaller than zero. So that means that our wave function at zero needs to be equal to zero. But what is our wave function there? Write this thing. So how will this be zero? It can only be zero if the sign of, or basically if, yeah, if the sign here is zero, right? So one over h bar, x2, x2, p of x prime dx prime plus pi over four, right? This needs to be zero. But for that to be zero, we need the interior, right? Since we need the sign to be zero, its argument needs to be a multiple of pi, an integer multiple of pi. So this will be some n pi with n equal one, two, three, four, etc. So here we have it. Let's now subtract this. So we get and multiply by h bar. So we get that the integral and now x begins at zero. So we can actually put that in, right? That is our smallest amount. So from zero all the way to our turning point, integral of our momentum, this has to be equal to, and we can factor out a pi. So we get n minus one over four and then we multiply by pi h bar. And there we have it. This is a condition for any potential where we can apply the WKB approximation as long as it has a positive slope, right? And of course it is for the situation where we have one wall only, right? To the left, there is nothing. We have only this one side. But as long as we have any potential, that satisfies this condition, then we can just say, okay, the momentum is square root of 2m. Now we are in the classical region, so it is e minus the potential. And there we go. And we simply solve for p, plug it in here, and we will be able to find the energy. Now let me show you an example. So let's say, Oops, I went one step too farther. Um, let's say that our potential is the harmonic oscillator. So our potential is one half m omega squared x squared. So that means that our momentum will be square root of 2m. And now in here, we have e minus one half m omega squared x squared. Now, to make our notation simpler, we will do something that uh, is done very often here in this sort of problem, and that is write our energy 
in term of the turning point and then later we will plug it back in terms of the energy right because putting all of this and then solving this integral it is it looks nasty um, we don't really need to do this but it will make notation simpler now what is the turning point the turning point is the point where the energy and the potential become the same so that means that it is the energy right the energy will be the same as the potential evaluated at x2 and the potential evaluated at x2 is one half m omega squared x2 squared so from here we can see that x2 or basically well we, we can find x2 in terms of the energy we will need it soon since i already wrote it down um i will plug it back right because eventually we will want to convert back from x2 to energy so we can solve for x2 squared and let's see x2 squared is 2 times e divided by m omega squared okay so now here we can um, instead of writing e we can write this expression right there so we get square root of 2m 1 half m omega squared x2 squared minus 1 half m omega squared x squared so of course here the one halves will cancel out we can factor m squared and omega squared outside so we get m and omega and then we get square root of x2 squared minus x squared so this is a much uh, more simpler notation for our momentum and we can now plug it into our integral so we will take this plug it in there so by doing that, we get integral from 0 to x2. And then let's put this inside. So we get m omega, which we can take out of the integral, square root of x2 squared minus x squared, and then dx. So now we need to solve this integral. Now this integral um, might be familiar to you. It is something, a constant, minus our variable squared and the square root. In this sort of problems, we like to use a substitution that is x equal our constant, which in this case is x2, times the sine of theta. Why is this? Why do we like to do this? Because if we plug it in, right, I'm just gonna do it. So this goes from theta one to theta two, we'll find the values very soon. And if we plug it in, we have x to squared minus x to squared sine squared of theta. So we can factor out x to squared, which of course will simply be x2, and we get 1 minus sine squared of theta and dx, which we haven't yet um, replaced. So let's take dx. This is x2 and the derivative of sine theta, which will be cosine theta d theta now we plug dx in here which is x2 cosine theta d theta and this thing right here is cosine theta right and that is precisely why we used this method of substitution because now we went from you know this annoying square root to simply cosine theta well times this other cosine theta, of course. So we get cosine theta squared, but we know how to deal with that. And we now have another x2, so we get x2 squared. Now we get rid of all this. And the final step in our substitution is to find the new limits of integration. So what is theta one? So theta one is the equivalent of our previous limit here, which was zero. So if x was zero, we needed sine of theta to be zero, which happens at theta zero. In theta two corresponds to x two, which, right, if this is x two, we need, we need sine of theta to be pi over two. So there we go, those are our new limits. So from zero to pi over two. Okay, so now let's keep our constants here. Now this integral can be solved very easily if we now rewrite cosine squared as one plus cosine of two theta over two d theta. 
Now, of course, we can take the one half outside, right? That's pretty simple. And this is, of course, something um, you have to know uh, that trigonometric identity, right? It comes from cosine uh, squared plus sine squared is equal to one, and also cosine squared minus sine squared has to be equal to the cosine of two theta. So you add these two together and you get the formula that I just used. You have to know that identity. It is super important because this sort of integral shows up all the time. Okay, so now let's integrate this. The first integral is trivial, right? It is simply integrating one. So that isn't particularly difficult. So that is simply pi over two. Now this integral, will give us sine of two theta divided by two. And we have to evaluate this between zero and pi over two. However, when we evaluate this at zero, we get zero, right? Sine of zero is zero. And evaluated at pi over two, we get sine of pi, which is also zero. So this thing right here is zero. And what we get is m omega x two squared times pi divided by four. And what is this entire thing? What we were doing this entire time is simply finding this integral. Now that we found it, we know that its value has to be n with n one, two, three, four, right? Different possible energy levels minus one fourth pi h bar. So let's plug that in. So this has to be equal to n minus one fourth pi h bar. Now, finally, we need to get rid of this x2 squared, which we don't really know what it is. So let's write it in terms of the energy, right? We simply used it as a tool for our calculations to be easier. So now this leads to m omega, I'm going to put all the constants here and now plug in the value times 2e divided by m omega squared this has to be equal to n minus one over four pi h bar. Okay. Now let's take a closer look. We have pi on either side, so they cancel out. We have two here and four here, so we get a two. m, m, omega, omega squared. So the energy will be, we multiply by two, so we get two n minus one half times h bar omega. And there we go. This is actually the same value for the energy that we had found way back um, when we were just starting with perturbation theory. So this, as you can see, is very, very easy. We didn't have to solve the Schrodinger equation. All we did was solve one integral and that's it. Right? So this is just a quick use how, or a quick example, how you can use this formula. Of course, if you have some other case where you have a positive sloping potential, you can do the same, but for your case where the integral will of course be a little bit different. So that is everything for this video. I hope this was useful to you. If it was, please make sure to leave a like on the video, comment and subscribe, and maybe consider checking out my Patreon. I'll see you in the next video. Thank you very much for watching.